Blah. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Ving. Yes, sir. How are How you? How you doing, Jeff? How you doing? Pretty good, man. How are you today? I'm, oh, I'm doing Peachy King. Nope. Yes, sir. There we go. I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Very cool. There he is. The man, the legend himself. Yes, the Lee. computer expert. If you need to know anything about handheld computers or anything like cell phones, just ask me, man. I'm a wealth of information. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. I have None to say, of it has anything to do with computers. Of course. I'm a wealth of information, nonetheless. It's, it's, just an, it's just an opinion about computers, right? That's right. That's right. This is excellent. And can I hear you speak? Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you a Three Stooges fan? Uh, I think everybody is uh, is affected by them in some some manner or, or another. Right, right, right. I I totally I totally uh, can see that. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for coming on. Thank you for your time. Welcome to the show. This is uh, an unprecedented. Thank you for honor. your interest. Jeff. Oh man, are you kidding me? Uh, let's start it off. Let me let me start you off with a warm up question. You might hate this question. You might love this question. It's a question I ask all of my guests, and it might. Uh, I don't know how this is going to be received by the uh, uh, legendary Lee Ving, but I'm going to go for it. We'll just see what happens. Is pizza like the food pizza? Is pizza punk? And if it is punk, why is it punk? And if it's not punk, why is it not punk? in your opinion? Um, there are situations, subjects, uh, mathematical equations, scientific formulas uh, that relate to each other and affect each other. This is not one of those things. You have two isolated, completely independent, unaffected one by the other item items as as there were two subjects in the question you asked me and uh, i think that there's uh, one has no influence or effect on the other i love and respect that answer thoroughly it's a subjective <laughs> listen it's a subjective question and i feel like there's no right or wrong answer every answer is based on someone's personal like point of view on the situation so i really appreciate to add that to my catalog yeah, of answers thank you're you you're very welcome no problem. <laughs> let me ask you a question you you play a lot of instruments am i correct on this yes you start that's how you started off you weren't just you weren't just a a, a singer guitar player you played a what, what do you play exactly or what have you played or what are you familiar with in your in your uh, repertoire of instrumentation uh, so Primarily guitar, uh, piano, harmonica, mandolin, bass, and drums. Wow. Wow. So you're multi-instrumentals because uh. generally speaking, I don't know about like the general populace, but I, I think of you more or as I was like learning more about you. I think of you more as like a, a front man vocalist, like guitar player. I don't think of you as a multi-instrumentalist. So that was uh, profound to, to learn that you played a bunch of different stuff. I mean, you're, you're, you're well, well equipped, well equipped there. Yes. Thank you. Um, tell me about growing up in Philly. Oh, an adventure. <laughs> I'm sure as in any other place but uh, has its own, its own style and own characteristics. Um, uh, the weather for one thing is vastly different there than is in, in California or some other places. And uh, perhaps less comfortable, you might uh, feel free to say, to, had you had the experience of growing up there. It's uh, real hot in the summer and really cold in the winter, but uh, much more temperate in California. And uh, but it's a it's a center of learning and education and science in many ways, and uh, offers lots of things that you might be interested in and uh, you know can pursue. Offering that information there, the, the 
lots of schools, uh, technical institutes to train people, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and it's, it's a city that's been there for quite some time. So it has a long history and, uh, and lots of history, lots of famous people having to do there, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Did you, now I know you also spent some time in New York. Do you think in, in terms of eventually like getting into punk rock or the punk rock scene or however you, you place yourself within that paradigm, um, did New York, did New York inform that more than maybe Philly did? Did like what city had more of an impact on you in that kind of way? I had left the East Coast uh, a good long time before uh, punk rock was ever considered by anyone or invented or uh, whatever you might say. Got you. Got you. Um, and you also studied uh, sociology in college, in addition to music, how has sociology or has sociology also sort of like affected, you know, anything that you've done in the music world, whether it's dealing with people, whether it's writing a song, whether it's, you know, being on tour or, you know, meeting fans or anything, how has like sociology affect your, affected your life or your knowledge of it that you might've accrued when you were learning about it? It, it seems more of a uh, of a history than a how to. Gotcha. Having having studied it in in the way that it's presented to be studied nowadays in, in courses, so uh, it's informative. It's a, a description of social trends, perhaps more so than it's a. Uh, In instruction, instructionary in, 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 in any way um, about um, people and how they deal with problems and et cetera, et cetera, and what, what people do. It's, it's as much a history as it is uh, a science. Do you remember uh, if I have my information correct, you you once played some shows with John Zacherly of Shock Theater at some point, whether like it, like like on the same bill or something. Uh, yeah, in, in Philadelphia, I think uh, he may he was either a, a New Yorker. I don't believe he was Philadelphian, but New York's pretty close, so it's a short short train ride. Um, I think he was host of some things we might've done at the electric factory in Philadelphia. Hmm. And, uh, or we may have played something that he was already hosting and uh, asked us to play. Uh, I, I don't recall, it was quite some time ago. Gotcha. Um, when you look at rock and roll and you know what it started as and what it is when you look at it, like from like a macro perspective, not rock and roll, mm -hmm. punk rock, punk rock. When you look at punk rock from a big picture perspective, is punk rock essentially just a return? It's just rock and roll, is it not? Is it? Is it sort of? How, how would you sort of uh, um, look at the, look at all that? It's a it's a social attitude, and it's uh, it's as much a list of things that you. you don't take part in or that uh, you eliminate pieces of here, here and there. But uh, at, at the end of the day, there's only 12 notes and uh, you know, there's, there's just so much you can do, but it's a, it's an attitude. And, and I think most people would agree with that. Yeah. It's no, not, I would agree not, with that. Not particularly a separate thing that you would study in order to master. You know, it's right. not, it's not like, uh, you know, getting the left and right hand to work together on the keyboard or uh, something of that nature. It, it's, it's a, a, a list of things that you espouse or do not, I think. And, uh, and an attitude. 
Do you think that attitude was there, that same attitude in, in the 70s? Do you think that was there in the 50s when that when that form of music was forming? Yeah, in a way, it was it was such a rock and roll was such a different thing than what people had been used to before. It uh, it became confrontational in, in a way. Yeah. In lots of ways. And uh, that's part of the beauty of it. And that's part of what people were looking for at that time. And then later on again, that, yeah, yeah. Give me more of that. Give me more of the things I can not pay attention to and laugh at and uh, make jokes about and write songs about. saxophones and here's what i'm very curious to know because you so you, you you make your way out west and you start going to clubs and you start seeing some of the west coast punk bands playing in clubs and whatnot um what personally attracted you to this scene of people uh and how did it like how did it inform what you were going to do with your band fear? Like what, what sort of, um, what, what sort of was the, what magnetized you to everything? I liked the attitude change. I wanted to apply it to the music that I was doing and uh, take pieces of it and apply it to the, uh, to, to the way we were communicating with the audience. And uh, it worked out very well. It was an and it was a new scene, much like rock and roll had been at one point a long time prior to that. Yeah. So it was like a, another opportunity to to dig in. The name fear is a very it's a very straightforward single, you know, single uh, syllable word fear. It, it's, uh, you know, it, it symbolizes a lot of different things. Is it really, is there anything more to the name when you were coming up with the, the idea for this band name? Or is it as simple as going, hey, why don't we call ourselves Fear? Because fear is fear and yada, yada, yada. Well, there, there was definitely some of that. It's something that everyone can relate to and everyone has experienced. So it, uh, and it was uh, something that would leave people with questions as you just asked me and um, and it's 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 a name and it's some, something to be used for a purpose and it, and it worked out quite well it was uh, you know it, it was new and fresh and i think that's what people were looking for absolutely and the, the last name ving where does ving come from or what uh wh what led to you calling yourself lee ving uh, it's a, it's a common word. Uh, I'm leaving. No, you're not. I am. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's right there. It's right it's there on that. It it's right there on front street. And you would have never guessed until you ask leaving. Yes. What is leaving <laughs> right there in front street by Kensington and Allegheny? Yes. Yes. Right on the pinpointed on the map. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's um so here's another uh, so so another thing too is like you know in general you, you know you were you talked about what attracted you to that um to, to 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 punk or whatever um how did it uh what is it that you liked about eliciting a reaction in the audience what does it what does it do for you on stage and how does it or how did it um how did it help in sort of like representing what you were about? If that makes any sense. Uh, it was, it was the fact of there being such an audience reaction in comparison to what a normal audience reaction or a common audience reaction, better said, uh, was like at the time. 
So they they were not sitting there listening to you play with their girlfriend, hemming and hawing and playing with the drink and wondering what the hell else they could be doing. And, uh, what am I doing here? And, and I hope we can get out of here and uh, so we can get on with some more important activity than this kind of thing. And uh, the, the, the punk rock thing, just like it, it drew you in, grabbed you by the ears and wouldn't let you go till the show was over. And uh, people responded to it in kind, much like that. Uh, and it's a much more productive audience reaction than is one where you're attempting to uh, entertain these people who look for all the world like they're bored to tears as they, as they come in the door to the club paying more attention to their date than their, you know, whatever they're wearing or, or something, then uh, the, the possibility of being affected in some different way by this new strain of music. Would you say that you would, you and the, the rest of the band would try and elicit that reaction by any means necessary, anything that you, that could be said, you would say in order to get that reaction? More more was I looking for a thing that I could say or wanted to or had felt as though it would be improper to say in years past. And now here's this refreshing new thing where you could say anything you want. And specifically things that, that you know, if you have things that you want to say, it's, uh, it's much more of a refreshing idea. We just oh, knocked over oh. my camera. Man down. There he is. There he is. I think we need, need a slight alignment there. Let me ask you this. All right. So around, I don't know what year precisely, let's say around 1980-ish maybe, there's like these two terms that start, or there's a, fr around 1980, there's kind of like a fracturing of terms. And maybe it's not exactly 1980, but there is... There's punk and new wave. People are called, oh, this is punk. This is new wave. They kind of seem kind of seem to be coming from the same circles. Let me let, let me rephrase that question, actually. Uh, is there a difference between the terms punk and new wave is what I mean to say? Uh oh, we just lost you. Well, there we go. Now we're better. Now we're better than we were. And you seem to be a man that understands composition as well of like, I should have this much headroom and yada, 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 probably yes, from all the. I prefer that my uh, flowerly locks were visible <laughs> rather than not. I, 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 I totally get that. Um, let me ask you the question I was asking you before. Sure. You had these two terms that start. You have another oh, term. Punk and new wave. Yeah. yeah well, th there, was a, uh, there was a wide divergence between those two schools of thought. New wave was... I think meant to be a description of the more polite and slightly affected by this modern sort of thing, which contains punk as well. And, and that being a uh, more passable, more forgivable, more user-friendly, more audience-friendly, more musician-friendly, more friendly-friendly than was punk. Punk just didn't care you say what you say because you believe it's it's the truth and you, people want to believe it or not that's their problem and right. uh, and it also contains the the fact of uh, the shock value of things you, you can say that uh, were more forgivable in, in a punk scene and actually looked for by the audience that's what they were coming to hear it, partially and in some cases as much as the music is that um is that because of like record labels like selling records radio play that sort of thing you think it was a lot of combat uh, you know wanting to play this new form of music but knowing that the record labels were sort of hands off with, with it they didn't want anything to do with it sort of they didn't know what it was really understand it quite exactly and uh therefore were there any possibility of affecting their bottom line 
right they're wanting they're wanting to either hands off with it or do what they can to get rid of it or something akin to that so yeah and uh it was uh it, it was obviously a more abrasive both musically and uh and message wise and and uh from the banter from the stage and, and all that so uh yeah it was it was looked on as much different new wave and punk you guys started in 1977 but you didn't put out a record for a good five i mean you had you had a single out yet i love living in the city yeah. um but you so did you spend in that five-year period um was that just sort of spent like you know slowly refining songs that are going to the set list were you doing covers like what um when you finally did when you no, finally no, no covers all original music and uh, uh only covers where we felt as though there was something to be gained by adding punk to the strength of this piece uh just generally speaking and uh Yeah, so it was it was very refreshing, in a way, you know, not to be confined and constrained by what you felt you had to do in order to interest record companies. Now that they're out of the picture, assuming that they're not going to be interested in it, you could do whatever you wanted to. And uh, I think there was a lot of that added to the mix. Yeah, for someone who studied instruments in a more like academic sense like yourself when you were younger it like so basically it felt your it felt freeing to to not be constrained by rules you don't have any rules the way you do with those other forms uh that that's partially true i mean beyond the benefit of understanding them to the point where it enables you to play period um yes the, there was you could add and subtract things at will much more freely than you could when you were trying to um, become a part of the general music scene when, when you were not paying attention to any of that, just following, you know, your nose. It was, uh, it was liberating in a way. Were there songs that were left on the cutting room floor? before you put out your first LP that you had been maybe been playing at uh, earlier shows between, you know, 77 and 82? No, I think uh, that we were planning on using X amount of songs. And uh, that's what we wound up doing, making our first album to, to pass uh, the, the A and B side of our, uh, our first single. From my personal listening perspective, the, I, the way I take fear lyrics when I listen to fear songs, and I think that's one of the things that fear is known for as much as the music, the lyrics are incredibly biting in some cases in a good way, uh, as well as there's like a, a sarcasm, tongue in cheek. It's like a maybe even like a cynicism or like a, a sardonic perspective, world viewpoint um what was your approach when writing those lyrics did you take did you draw from a lot of your personal world experience your your whatever just life experience when you're when you're coming up with lyrics and stuff for your songs uh yes both uh out of politics and the and the laws that are everyone has to uh pay attention to and uh yeah it was it was refreshing in that way that it was not the same thing being said and uh and uh and used to denote what your what what your uh expectation of history is and of things that you need to do now in order to succeed and in order to popularize what you're doing. And in as much as it's very different than, uh, than the, the standard 
things of standard origin. Did um, the song, without getting into uh, current topics, of course, but from a more historical perspective, the song Let's Have a War, is that like, does that come from, you know, witnessing the Vietnam War or uh, any other war yes, in particular? Uh, uh, vi- witnessing all wars and that it's it's a way to be avoided towards settling problems, not pursued. It, it wants to be overcome as necessary. I think it's one of the great, I think it's like one of the great songs about war period in, in music, like straight up. Like you have a lot of, thank you. What's what you're very welcome. What's interesting is you have a lot of songs that are, you know, like for instance, on the flip side, you have John Lennon singing about like, uh, all we are saying is give peace a chance, or you have, you know, the song war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. These very, these messages are so upfront on the nose. And then you look at a song like let's have a war, which is exactly, which is what you just said is exactly there. The idea of like, this is how to not have a war or a way of, 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 um, you know, uh, not preaching. Preaching is not the word I want to use. The way of um, just spreading this ma- uh, this anti-war message, but it's done so subversively. It's so subversively. It's it's going a completely against the grain, and coming from everything from like a really cynical perspective, or you know, just sort of like a sardonic um, perspective. And I just think that's really great. I wish more writing was like that. You know. Thank you. We make stickers, banners and buttons too Posters and promo cards There's nothing we can't print for you From stage backdrops to bass drum heads We can print on shirts We can print on hats We can print Let me ask you this let me switch gears on you for a minute what do you think attracted john belushi to punk music in general uh the fact of it being genuine and honest and that's separating it from most other things most other kinds of music especially at the time was that that was very apparent in john from what you knew of john was that ver- that was very much in his personality in general uh what was like um just everything you said about why he liked why yes. he was attracted to punk rock yes hmm that's interesting and um that eventually led to your infamous snl appearance do you get sick of talking about this by the way the snl story do you ever get like no, sick of it was it was very <laughs> uh great opportunity yeah it was uh it, it came off it was a, a great show both for us and the fantastic show yes and it it uh it actually moved the whole scene forward in uh, quite a bit and uh and john was instrumental on getting us on the show so it was it, it worked out it was all all positive did you have any inkling that that was what was going to happen on the broadcast was it something that was there any sort of like sort of pre-med not saying like i I have this blueprint to do this but maybe just like in the back of your mind some sort of like pre-medited i'm going to do this i'm going to be myself and that it could elicit this sort of response did you have any idea uh 
I knew that the musical guests on Saturday Night Live were traditional. I knew that this kind of music was not traditional and that uh, there were a, a few ways that it could have played out. And I, I think that it, it did very well. It was, it was very well noticed. Everybody was writing about it the next day. And uh, it, was, it was historical. It was very beneficial. It was a way of opening up the, the fact of this new style and, uh, and showing the, the population of the US for one thing and the world. I mean, the world was already hearing it. They already had heard the Sex Pistols. But, uh, you know, they, we wanted to expose them to the American style of this viewpoint. So I'm really glad you brought up the Sex Pistols because there are a couple of interesting observations about this infamous, famous, iconic SNL performance on Halloween. Number one, yes, you're right. The only other all like maybe more new wave to use the term new wave sort of like acts that had been on SNL. You had Devo, which that's like adjacent. It's not, that's not punk. Like, or that's not what you would consider punk. And you had Elvis Costello, which also new wave, like not punk. You are no, the more commercial music. Right. And what else is interesting is this is pre-internet where if you wanted to reach millions and millions of people you weren't going to do it on a twitter you weren't going to do it on youtube you had to get on like network tv on a live broadcast and what's interesting to the, the what's really interesting is you look back at what happened to the sex pistols it was sort of like a similar situation where they went on grundy they did some cursing and suddenly they broke, that broke the, the Sex Pistols as well as this sort of phenomenon of like punk or whatever internationally. And then this was the American version of that. That was the British version, as you said, this is the American version where um, suddenly now, because everybody, what does everybody do on Saturday night in 1980? They watch SNL. Watch well, Saturday Night Live is one of them. Right, right. Um, so it was, really was a stroke of genius and then Refresh my memory. What happened like the next day or a couple of days later? You got a phone call from the press, and what did they 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 were asking you questions about what happened? Yes, they wanted. I think they wanted to know more about what what is this thing that uh, had such an impact was so obviously new, different, and. Uh, they, they wanted, and, and being presented on Saturday Night Live, I mean, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty <laughs> big deal. And how did that happen? And they were just as curious about that as they were about what we were playing, which was also very different. You did probably, I guess, not to like, you know, I say that again, you probably did the most punk thing ever by saying, by playing New York's All Right, if you like saxophones. Yes. On SNL. <laughs> <laughs> how did how did the crowd not the not the punk rockers that were moshing how did the crowd that was watching that how did they react to that they they were very enthusiastic about it they oh, were really? deeply involved in it they were moving and grooving there was not a still body in the house did you know all those punk punkers were going to come up from like dc and come down from boston and whatnot no that was icing on the cake that was I said, so you come out onto the stage and you see what clearly is a punk audience waiting for you. And that must have do you think that might have even egged you on a little bit more? Like you sure. saw that your people and were there. Have them, you know, be up out of their seats and wrestling around and gyrating and uh, and doing the slam dance and all was was very uh, reassuring. Uh, was the reason that we wanted to be there because we wanted to do that to to cause that to occur and when it worked out that way it was it was very reassuring 
And then you, you have papers that are calling you up because there was damage. There was damage done. There was uh, equipment was busted up and they're trying to, they're corroborating numbers with you. Yes. People throwing stuff at each other and uh, wrestling with each other. All very different than your normal polite audience. So you could say that at SNL, New York City, SNL, whatever the the, the rainbow built. What is it called? The the f- famous building, uh, the NBC, whatever, where, wherever you were, the, the the building, the building where everything where everything is where, where they do SNL. Uh, it, it was Halloween, so they didn't get a treat. They got a trick. A trick and a treat. They got right. Yeah, they got a trick and a treat. Right. And um, did did and and then what happened? So like there was like. The, how much there was like damage that was done to the studio or something right like there was like the kids went crazy and things got yes. busted and uh things like uh mr dick ebersaw got hit in the chest with a pumpkin and uh it smashed and uh, went all over the place and all sorts of uh impromptu things that don't normally occur on saturday night live or anywhere else Mis- mischief and, it was so it was just a, a a good healthy sign for this thing which had a message could use more attention and was getting it by virtue of the fact that it was being performed on saturday night live and john was instrumental in helping uh, not to coin a phrase but uh, toward helping us get to be the musical guests well i must say um whoever is up there thank the lord for uh john belushi in doing that so that we can talk about this uh incredible event uh 40 years on um now the pumpkins that's an interesting little detail that i don't know if i was familiar with did you guys bring the pumpkins were the pumpkins just a part of the it was halloween right it was very close to halloween so the pumpkins were there for for that reason that because you know whatever general halloween celebrations were going on That's why they were there. But they also uh, can be um, projectiles. Yes. Pumpkins pumpkins can be. The Green Goblin uh, will tell you that. (laughs) Yes. And and so it it served a (laughs) multi-purpose. Yes. Um, The crew, not not the audience, the crew, as this is going on, and I know it's like a blur to you because it's like you're pumping on with adrenaline. You're doing this show. There, mu- first of all, did you? You must have felt pressure. Was there some pressure that, that you felt personally? Uh, not necessarily. I, I'm not certain that people knew what to expect or what we were going to do or what we sounded like. Even mm. a few people knew. John was one of them, and I think John had that one eyebrow up over this whole thing that he was instrumental. That not to coin a phrase and uh putting together and then uh waiting to see the reaction which is something akin to what he expected i believe did he he no he was already gone from snl by that point he was trying to break he was breaking out into movies he did blues brothers he did neighbors which you were also sort of affiliated with um do you think that this putting fear on snl was kind of like a little bit of like uh like throwing revenge. a banana peel yeah revenge okay that's a better word i was gonna say banana peel but you you said you said the r word yes revenge you think that was like a retaliation against snl uh sure in some way whatever feelings existed mm, of, uh, interesting what were, were i think he felt were were funny and that uh and that he could he could use that feeling after having dealt with saturday night live and wound up like not being on the show for a while or something and uh this this was reassuring to him right Right. Did you um and the re- the record had not come out yet. The record had you recorded had you even gone to the studio yet to do the record? I don't believe so. No. Right. H- had you hooked up with uh Penelope Spears and done Decline of Western Civilization yet? It's uh was that 80 or 81? I don't know. What what year was Saturday Night Live? I believe that was Halloween of 81. I'm looking it up on my phone right now. What year did Fear play SNL? Google. According to Saturday Night Live Wiki, fandom, 
Fear is an American punk band. They were banned from SNL after an appearance as musical guest on the 1981. It was 1981. Oh. It was, and and you guys were and so what is the reaction to finding out that you're banned from SNL? Like, is it? I mean, it's just kind of like. <laughs> yes, it, it it was it was not so out of the question of possibilities and uh so that it was not also uh, it was in your general music business way of thinking of things uh a, a problem but it was it was also uh, uh, went quite a long way to enhance the popularity of the fact of that performance right right t-shirt casualty t-shirt casualty very tight t-shirt casualty t-shirt casualty very tight I wish Jeff made some t-shirts too Hold on, I think he does that too I can order them in the description below And I can impress those friends that I know T-shirt casualty, t-shirt casualty Very tight and then you also got involved with the decline of the western civilization documentary which is like a masterpiece of documentary work period um what was lots what? of those bands were on slash records and here and from here in los angeles uh, uh so uh yeah that was all good um what was the, how how did that differ from say going on snl in terms of like you know that this performance is being filmed for a documentary did that um did that kind of inform how you were going to do we that show? We didn't know that the Saturday Night Live performance was being filmed as a documentary by anybody. Well, oh, no, I meant was that it was being filmed for Saturday Night Live the way oh. they always do and presented in the same way. No, the I was actually ref- vastly different. I was I was referring to uh, decline of Western civilization at the documentary, not not uh, oh, not SNL. Oh. Yeah. And then on top of it, you, you get into acting. I mean, you just you become this actor and you're in this movie that I love. I got to see this on the big screen. I was very happy because it doesn't play. It, you couldn't find it for the longest time. Get crazy. You were in this movie. Get crazy. And I was shocked to see you in it. I didn't know what to expect when I was watching it. And then all of a sudden you pop up. I'm like, holy crap, that's Lee Ving. Um, what do you remember about? Do you remember anything about being on the set of that of Get Crazy making that movie? Sure. And what about Flashdance? Ah, uh, yes, and Flashdance as well. That's right. You are also in Flashdance. And you're also in this movie. Uh, you play the bad guy in Dudes, which was a pleasant yes. surprise. And in Clue. Yes. With Madeline Kahn and Eileen Brennan. Yes. Mall. Wow. What a, that's what I, when I, when I, in general, I think outside of the music world, when people hear the name Lee Ving, they ought to, they, Clue pops up immediately um as as you are the uh the instigator of all the the action in the film but you you have the uh in in the movie dudes you uh you kill flea's character in and yes. set off this cross country chase uh what was it like working with flea and flea was in fear tell me about yes. that how did that happen and penelope spheris was director right Yes, she was. She directed Dudes. It's a really interesting movie because it kind of has like this punk bend, but it also was like a Western. It's also like a cross country movie. Yes. Just all of those things rolled into one. Um, what what would tell me about uh, uh, Flea being in fear? How, he he came into the band for for a period of time. Yes. Uh, he, he's a really good player. 
and uh, fit right in. It worked out great. And then literally, he I think he exits fear, and then he starts the, the Chili Peppers start. Well, that had already happened. The Chili Peppers oh. had already started before he was in fear. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. I don't know if that particular version of his group was was the one. Right. But, uh, he was actively at at that be, before we were before we were uh, in cahoots. So now, most recently, I've seen you before. I want to ask you about the new album and 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 stuff. Um, and for I just want to say, first of all, thank you again for doing this. This was this was so amazing to speak with you and to hear uh, you talk about your experiences. Truly fantastic. I most recently was watching Glenn Danzig's newest film called Death Rider in the House of Vampires, and was just tickled to see you playing a bartender. You're not only are you a bartender, but you're a bartender vampire in the old West. Tell me about that. How did you get involved with that project? What was it well, like? What was, what was this film you're talking about? Uh, Glenn Danzig's film, death rider and the house of vampires, vampire Western. And what part did I play in that? You played a bartender. It uh, it may have been like a a one night's worth of work, or or something of that nature. Uh, at that time, was very busy. There, there was quite a right, bit of right. Um, what is your opinion on seeing these big bands reunite? These punk bands reuniting, like for instance, the Misfits getting back together, and you guys did a couple of shows with them. Uh, uh, a couple of shared a couple of bills with the the reunited Misfits. Um, do you remember them back in the day, the, the band, the misfits? Sure. Um, what was their sort of reputation back then? How were they sort of viewed on the West coast? Um, they, they were held in good regard and, uh, I think their shows were well attended and, uh, they seemed to be for all intents and purposes successful. Yeah. That's great. And um, did you see, do you remember seeing those shows or being, I mean, playing those shows with the reunited band? Um, what was, do you remember what the audience reception was like at those shows? Was it, uh, was it, cause that's like one of those reunion holdovers, like people thought was never going to happen. And then all of a sudden those guys are, are playing, playing shows again together. Um, did you did you notice uh did you see that impact when they were playing live at all anything like that uh we we were more interested in the reaction that we were going to get and did get of course, of course. and uh otherwise it was just uh a uh, a facilitation of getting another performance in an in, uh, opportunity. And uh, we were always wanting to take advantage of, of that whenever, whenever that happened to expand the audience. Of course. And um, I got to tell you, you know, I was looking at some YouTube video of you guys playing live now, and your voice is uh, a force to be reckoned with today. Like you really, it, it's really tremendous. The power that you have on on the Thank stage you. and Thank um you. you're very welcome uh and what what i'm curious to know is you know doing shows is it's you know there's a lot of work that goes into doing a show what do you do personally when you're when you go out it's like it can be um what's the word it can be an endurance trial to an extent um yeah it is it's a it's a athletic performance as much as anything else in many ways and uh it was it was all part of the reason I was drawn to to do this, and to bring some musicality to uh, to a performance of our band that might not be able to be done by other bands. That therefore, giving us an advantage, and anything that gives you an advantage in the business as as difficult as this and cutthroat as this is good. I. 
could not agree more. Um, what are some per do you like do any like stretching or vocal things, or is there anything For that sure. you do? I went to the gym and lifted weights and ran, did did all kinds of things. Um do you and you've been slowly it's my understanding and please correct me if i'm wrong i i I'm, I'm, it's my understanding that you're you're you've been slowly been putting together a new album we're always doing that so i've always been slowly putting together a new album since i've been like four years old um <laughs> what how has tell me about the process this time is there is there anything different is there anything any sort of surprises um that people might appreciate that you're putting together do you have um any any are, are all the songs new newer compositions or some holdovers or uh we're getting ready to release uh two three-sided releases uh, one, one will, uh, and they will all be original fear songs, many written by me and in collaboration with my bandmates. Um, and I, I think that, uh, we'll be hopefully releasing one of them soon. And then the other one, a little bit down the road, uh, there'll be two, three, three side releases. Did you um you have any guests coming on any of these rec records? I'm certain that there will be. Oh, that's great. I'm really glad to hear that. Um I had heard that there was a recording. So legend goes that the the John Belushi album uh John Belushi movie Neighbors had a song and you guys performed it but John sings the vocals. What has happened to this recording? Has it, I heard it like kind of resurface. What's the deal with that? It's in the process of being released. Fantastic. So we'll see the light of day and it's called neighbor. The song itself is called neighbors. Yes. And the, the movie is called neighbors too. Right. And you had written the lyrics for that. Yes. That's, that is absolutely fantastic. And um, are there any other projects that fear ha is involved with? Isn't there uh, something uh, visual that's been in the works for some time cooking? Uh, what do you mean? A movie? Yeah. Like a movie documentary, anything like that. Well, uh, there, there was a bunch of it with Penelope's movie in the old days and uh, drips and drabs on the news here and there where we'd be in, in just in town for something. Um, I'm certain there will be more of it as, as we get toward releasing these things. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full-time. I want this to be my full-time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it gonna be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like 
a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just wanna thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents. Okay, here's another question. I don't know if you can, I don't know if you have any inkling of this or remember this, but maybe you can clarify it for the record. Was there ever a time where you almost were going to be in a super group with uh, the members of these other punk bands, Bobby Steele of the Misfits, Earl Hudson of the Bad Brains, and Joey Shithead of DOA? I don't recall specifically being offered a position among those people, but you never can tell. It might well have been thought about in some circles and they just never made it out of those circles. Very possible. Very possible. Thank you for clarifying that. Is there anything that like annoys you that people do? Like when you're, when you're playing a show and uh, people get riled up, maybe they like get on the stage and stage dive. Is like, there anything like crazy that you see like an audience do that like kind of, um, uh, dri drives you up the wall or do you just love all of it and embrace all of it and just go with it? it? It basically seems like it's within the parameters of the spirit of the, of the thing. And uh, as long as that continues to feel that way, I, I think everything has pretty well been in order. Let me ask you this. Is there, is there a big difference in for someone who you're, you're a Renaissance man, you you're a musician and you're an actor, you do a lot of stuff. Is there a difference in approach to when you're acting in a film as opposed to writing music and, and lyrics or, you know, doing a live stage show? Like how, how do you approach those two sort of, um, Forms. Well, the music thing, the stage show is us. And I just go to my honest feelings about whatever subject I happen to be writing about. And, uh, uh, but then in, in a film where you're portraying something that happened at a, at a certain point in history, there can be an advantageous way of showing that too. But uh, you're still confined at least to getting the historical portion of that performance uh contained in what you're doing so that there's more more to that than just what what i would consider uh necessary to be looked at for uh for musical releases for us last question for you mr ving um you did a song with dave grohl for his uh sound city project which is about it's this really cool documentary for those of you who don't know Lee was a part of this documentary about essentially a mixing console. It's not a mixing console. It's like the, it's the whole recording studio. Um, and it's headed by Dave Grohl. And he, he got a bunch of different um, combinations of various iconic musicians and they recorded songs. And you guys did a song called Your Wife is Calling. Tell me about yes. that. Tell me all about that and that process. Uh, it, it was a pleasure work, working with Dave on anything. And uh, yeah, it was it was advantageous to for, for us to have recorded that. It was it was very helpful. And we we did others. We played some shows with Dave, and uh, it was great. We were really happy to do that. Those lyrics for your wife is calling. Is that you? Those are your lyrics. Yes. And you just sort of built the song th through jamming. Or how did that come together? Like the, the music part of it? Um, it comes together looking for audience reaction, looking for a specific reaction or presenting an idea. 
Very cool. Um, last thing, Mr. Ving, what's coming up for fear in the immediate future? Do you have any any sort of concrete information as where you would want to direct viewers? Uh, any live shows coming up? Any any sort of thing like that? Yes, two, three record sets which are in the process of being released now. And uh, we look forward to having them become a part of everyone's record collection. You work Not with just punk rockers. You work with Adam H uh, Industries, right? Adam H. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic company. Their, their releases, uh, just all the stuff that they do, all the, the you know, they do T-shirts and records and all sorts of things. Um, the, the quality is fantastic. I would advise everybody to go to Adam H dot com or whatever the the url is i'll make sure to put it in the description um they just do fantastic work i've been seeing the the fear reissues that they've been putting out gorgeous gorgeous colors gorgeous stuff and uh, i would advise everybody to go and check out what fear has over at adam age as well as um just anything else that they might have in their wares yes so. working with uh, robert rc at Adam Age has uh, has been always very good. Yeah, Robert is an awesome guy, and shout out to Robert truly. Tipping tipping our hat. Amen. Okay, thank you again to Mister Leaving of Fear. That's right, the friggin' the man himself. Um, uh, and man, thank you for saying that, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> it's truly truly an honor. And thanks for having me on.